You're tuned in to Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. I'm your host, Jason B. Woodbury. My guest this week is Hari Kunzru. He's a novelist and a writer. His latest is called Red Pill. It's about a writer who receives a fellowship in Germany, where he finds himself sucked into a spiral of reactionary thinking. His other 2020 project is a podcast called Into the Zone from Pushkin Industries. It's about, well, to put it in reductive terms, the opposite of reactive thinking. Examining the liminal spaces between borders, visiting Stonehenge, remarking on the early days of the internet, examining what divides country from the blues, and even what constitutes life and what constitutes death, Kunzru blurs binaries and swims in the waters of the undefined. It's a great and fascinating show, and I'm happy to have him on here to discuss it. A quick note, though, we recorded this before the election, and I'm recording this intro before the election, too, so there's that. Okay, without delay, let's get into it. Thanks for tuning into Transmissions. We'll speak more on the other side. Uh, Hari, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us here on the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions podcast. It's a real pleasure to have it's you. It's great to be here and also great to see you on my screen in a Phil Deck t-shirt with a third eye on his forehead. Great t-shirt. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I found it on, uh, I found it on the internet. There's all sorts of stuff you can find there. I saw I hear. I think that there's a, yeah, I think, I think, <laughs> I think it's a big place with a lot of weird, weird stuff. Um. Are you are you a PKD? I'm looking forward to trying it. Yeah, are you are you a uh, are you a PKD fan? Do you like Philip K. Dick? Is he somebody you enjoy? I'd say I'd say I'm a moderate PKD fan. I'm um I'm definitely not in the in the big league of of people who are kind of combing through the uh the the sort of enormous volume of diary writings and stuff. But um I definitely appreciate his strange kind of sliding away from 1970s reality. Yeah. Yeah. He's an interesting dude. And I mean, I've been reading a lot, especially this year. This is a weird year to read a lot of Philip K. Dick, but, um, sure. But yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's definitely the, the exegesis, those journal entries. That's a wild, there's a, I've got a copy of it and I've, I've read a, a fair amount of it, but it's not a, it's not light reading for sure. No, I, I bought a copy as well because I was very admiring that Jonathan Lethem uh, edited edited such a kind of, and it's a very difficult project to edit, I should think. And so I've kind of dipped into it and I, I feel it's a book that needs more time than I can give it right now. Yeah, yeah. There's a great, there's a great book called uh, High Weirdness by Eric Davis that came out maybe two years ago. Uh, and it, talk it, it it deals a lot with the weirder side of dick and kind of presents everything about his writing and sort of a framework of the weird 70s in general i I highly recommend it oh that sounds great yeah i think i, I ran into eric davis i used to run into him in kind of like the 90s in uh yeah in the kind of yeah the sort of wiggier end of the of the tech culture scene in the 1990s he was around there was a book called tech gnosis wasn't there yeah, that's his his website is called that as well. Yeah, that uh, there's an episode of the podcast where you you sort of talk about the the 90s, the sort of the the early internet age and uh Sure. I mean, it it seems like it must have been such a, a an interesting time to come up in this in this world, you know? It was very strange. I mean, it's I mean, it's you know, you say it to young people now and they don't believe you, but I mean, I you know, I was I was 20 two or something when i first got an internet connection and it was just before the world wide web really took off in like 92 93 and i think when i first got the first got a kind of email account and you know some kind of access to the internet there were there were like a there was like a low four figure number of websites right um, right you know, and and by about two years later that you know there was a sort of exponential growth at just that point and to be quite honest 
that turned into my only marketable skill. Like all I wanted to do was be a writer and nobody wanted to hear my opinions on books or, or music or anything like that for at that point. But I did know roughly what the internet was. I could explain to you why it was a good idea to plug a computer into a phone line. Right, um, and right. that's you know, that's pretty much how I made my living f- through my through my twenties. Was you know I've written I've written a lot of sort of listicles about viruses and things like that. <laughs> so so you of course did eventually become somebody who writes books. You've written a lot of books, and they're out there for people to see. What inspired your your decision to make a podcast? Into the Zone is like a new venture for you. Uh, how did you find yourself going down that road? Well, I've always loved audio. I'm music has always been a huge part of my life, and you know, I've always sort of dreamed of being able to kind of I don't know make make something in that field. You know, I'm I'm not a musician, and you know, I'm a very sort of pure fan in that way. But um, I love telling stories, and I had a lot of like weird material that doesn't fit into fiction, and um, was kind of perfect for for that kind of. I mean, as you know, like a podcast is a very intimate format. It's it's quite conversational, and if people like the, just the general way your mind works, they'll follow you down, you know, some pretty weird paths. And and I got very lucky in that I found, uh, you know, that people approached me and, and then they just sort of said, Jake and, and Malcolm, who run Pushkin Industries, said to me, we like what you do, tell us some stories. And they, they pretty much were just happy with, with wherever I would take it. So that's been, that's been really, it's been really great. And, and you know, I'm hoping to, to get to do it some more. Obviously, you know, you've already hit on the personal side of things. The podcast, you know, it feels like it's a very personal project in a, in a way, because obviously you're telling really fantastic stories about uh, subcultures and, and you know, punk rock musicians and, uh, and you know, weirdo new age stuff, but, but you're examining yourself through all of it as well. Um, was that, a, was that, a, is that a comfortable sort of way to work? It's, it's new to me. I have to say, like I was, I was one of the reasons I've always written fiction is because I find it easier to to deal with my my stuff, so to speak, um, behind the screen of making up characters and making up situations that are distant from me. But I've kind of wanted to try and write in a more sort of autobiographical mode, and and and. I don't know, I was 50 this year, so there's a kind of element of, you know, sort of stock-taking creeping in, and it seems to be quite a good moment to look back, for example, and talk about when I was a, a sad philosophy grad student in my early 20s and got into this sort of cyber culture scene at my kind of rather rather grim uh, Midlands British University, you know, or talking about family stories, about about visiting India when I was a kid and discovering various family connections to theosophy and madame blavatsky and so on so that it's it, something i probably wouldn't have done earlier but it feels a little easier now somehow how has producing the show been in in lockdown i mean obviously you got to travel around while you were making it it's sort of a uh, you're all over the place on this first season um but in terms of assembling it i mean has most of that been done this year yeah, it has. And um, I mean, I'm speaking to you from inside this uh, kind of box that I've built in uh, in my study. I've got this um, sort of six by six foot timber frame that I've I've uh, I've hung curtains and, and duvets and all the rest of it. So I have a I have this kind of little world that I, I come into and I've I've done all the um, the tracking for the podcasts in here. I read my audio book in here. I've I've spent the last kind of month or so doing interviews with people in here. It's really become a kind of permanent part of my my little setup here. You know, there's a there's a chair just outside it which I sit in to do Zoom stuff yeah. and to teach people. And then there's a desk and a chair. You know, I mean, it's like it's like the kind of my world has shrunk down to this little um, book lined pod and you know it could be worse i think i'm kind of you know i'm wired up to do this i was born to to do this really like if i could just kind of hang out and 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 read and and share my weird ideas with people that's you know 80 percent of what i'd want to do anyway right right 
so it's a show ostensibly it's it's a show about opposites um yeah but it's it's also each episode has been sort of about the way things overlap and the idea that opposites and binaries like those are those are cool ideas but in reality they rarely work out as cleanly as you might hope right so um you know you've got an episode where you're talking about how the borders of country music have changed and and how countries' origins, country music's origins, are far more integrated, black and white, than maybe the average person thinks, you know, uh, sort of through the lens of Little Nas's X, Little Nas X, Old Town Road, you know. Um, you head to Stonehenge at one point. You're doing you're doing all this stuff, you know. I, I'm curious on that personal end of things. You grew up, you know, uh, basically you grew up sort of in into the zone of overlapping cultures, yeah. you know. Is is that where the idea started for you in terms of thinking about borders and, and who gets to decide them? Absolutely. It, it was, in a way, it's the kind of deepest part of the sort of autobiographical aspect of the show. You know, I, I grew up in the very sort of far eastern suburbs of of london um i mean we were the real kind of bridge and tunnel crowd of 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 london in essex and um you know and i have my dad's indian and my mom's english and and it was a it was a world where i was made very aware that i wasn't you know fully white and um but also because my dad's the only one who came over to britain I would kind of only see my Indian family very occasionally. I'd kind of drop into this world of a very traditional Indian extended family. And then suddenly I would feel incredibly English. Uh, and so that kind of feeling of existing in between these two worlds was always part of my my kind of psychological makeup. And so I've always been attracted to things where where people do examine binaries and show that the kind of very firm uh kind of rigid boundaries that we use to organize the world often aren't aren't as uh, clear cut as we'd hope i mean the, the the one i always come back to is life and death which is the the final episode which is yet to yet to come out as we're talking um, i mean i don't know what, i don't know when we're gonna this podcast is gonna come yeah, out yeah it'll, uh, it'll it'll have been aired by the time this people get to hear this one okay Okay, cool. So it's just you know, so it's so the the one I always come back to is is life and death, which is the kind of subject subject of the final of the eight episodes of the podcast. And you know, you'd think that's the clear, you know, surely that's a binary opposition where we know what's alive and we know what's dead. And as it turns out, it's a subject of a certain amount of controversy among scientists. Like I went looking for a paper or a scientific paper to say like what is the current, you know, state of the art definition of 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 life. And there were one hundred and twenty three competing definitions. Right. going on i mean most definitions have the kind of you know i mean there is a bunch of stuff that you tend to agree on that you need to be able to kind of take in energy and grow and and have a boundary between yourself and the rest of the world and so on and so forth but you know here we are in the middle of a pandemic caused by a virus and a virus is an organism that is absolutely on that boundary like it can't reproduce itself without hijacking the reproductive apparatus of a cell so it doesn't fulfill one of the basic criteria for being alive. And yet it proliferates. It makes copies of itself. It totally runs the world right, right. now, this virus. Um, and so there we are. We're in a, we're in a gray zone there. And, um, you know, and, and that's a kind of way of thinking that I, I think is often very productive. I mean, we're in a, you know, politically, we're in a polarized moment. We're in a... Uh, a moment where people are hardening divisions and taking sides. And um, it is often quite interesting to pick away at that a little bit and, and find out, um, you know, whether some of these, these clear cut oppositions are actually that clear cut. Do, you know, when, when we, so when we think that way, right, when we think in terms of binaries and when we think of uh, things in terms of this is this and this is that, you know, what does that cut us off from, you think, that is useful for living like a, a good, flourishing life? Well, I mean, I don't want to say that I'm a kind of, you know, advocate for some sort of sort of wishy-washy both sidesism, but I mean, I, I definitely 
would would go for the the complex version rather than the simple version in most uh, in most of these kind of questions. I mean, another show is about native and migrant, and and clearly that's a that's a personal question for me. Um, and I fully understand the ways that people want to feel connected to a place. They want to feel connected to a certain landscape, perhaps. And and you know there are there are very sort of profound things to do with identity that that do map onto the world in that kind of way. But at the same time, it isn't that simple. And those stories aren't aren't always true stories. And you know I I found out about a. A Harvard geneticist whose um, uh, whose work consists of um, sequencing DNA from ancient human remains, and a, a, a reason to do that is that you know you can take a DNA sample from a, a living human, and you can tell a certain amount going back about uh, who you know who who your ancestors are. But at a certain point, that information kind of you know it kind of goes it goes to infinity. There's a point beyond which you can't reach in the, when you go back generations and generations and generations. The information just isn't there anymore. Um, but if you if you look at somebody who was around ten thousand years ago and you and you manage to scrape a little tiny bit of DNA, it's a very hard process. It's a very kind of interesting um, you know set of things they have to do to even you know get the DNA out of these these kind of samples. But then you've got, you know, you've basically leapt further back and you can kind of, you know, you can reach even further back than that. And what they discovered is this whole kind of set of patterns of migration around the world where a lot of people who feel that they've been there since time immemorial, wherever there is, turn out to have actually, you know, been migrants at one point. And the, the thing that really stood out to me is that the people who built Stonehenge have, you know, the, the symbol of ancientness in, in Britain and kind of the world um they have no genetic relationship to modern british people at all they were displaced and so um you know there's there's an irony there from somebody who was told to go home when he was a, a kid and felt that he was at home and so i i kind of wrap that very personal story together with right. this like cosmic story about stonehenge and, and and ancient migrations and that seems to be a really a really good way of telling these quite kind of complicated abstract stories about science or whatever like to to just to hang them on something you know very direct and personal the show uh em embraces a fair amount of like weird weirdness you know in terms of kind of like weird uh theosophy something like theosophy in terms of like a kind of out there uh philosophical slash religious framework and then there's you know Obviously, we've already talked a little bit about the Druids, you know, uh, you you reference ghosts every now and then just in terms of, you know, trace audio, things like that. Um, so it feels like there is a little bit of the um, it, the feel of the show almost feels like at any point you could start talking about the paranormal, say, you know, as a uh, <laughs> as an as an idea, you know, Um but the way you talk about some of this stuff is really interesting to me because it doesn't feel to me, you know, so often anytime we approach, I mean, this isn't, this isn't strictly, uh, confined to conversations about weirdness. It's confined to all conversations, you know, uh, or it's inherent in most conversations. There's this sense of like, you're a believer or you're a non-believer. You're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're into weird stuff or you're not into weird stuff. You're a skeptic or you're, you know, like a, like a fervent prophet or whatever. And so I wondered if maybe for you, your interest in some of this stuff in some of the more slightly fantastical elements that you touch on as you go about, you know, um, do you, do you view your, like, are you into, are you into the weird stuff? Is that, is that, a, is that an area for you that you, you know, let's say the, the weird in just a general sense, is, is that something that interests you? I, it it does. I'm completely fascinated by you know there are more things on heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. You know that 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 kind of feeling that there are there yeah. are sort of an infinite richest richness of subcultures and and points of view out there. But I'm not a believer. That's I mean I'm not really very wired up to be a kind of you know fervent believer in 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 some sort of uh, uh, faith based world picture but i'm also not terribly interested in just kind of debunking my interest let's say in something like ufos or um theosophy 
is is basically what it does for people what kind of you know what kind of feelings and what kind of experiences do you have if you know if you are a spiritualist or a ufo abductee and i think you can you know by taking that kind of I don't know, just sort of listening to what they're actually saying about what they're feeling, you know, I mean, regardless of whether you believe in the kind of their explanations for, for something, you often kind of learn a great deal about, so I'd call them structures of feeling and structures of experience. Um, you know, the U the UFO thing completely fascinates me, although I'm, you know, I, I'm not terribly, to be honest, invested in, you know, are, are aliens real or, or not? My interest is is in it as a kind of expression of religious faith and a kind of weird combination of a kind of technological set of um, experiences with a, with a kind of older spiritualist set of experiences. I mean, I think it couldn't have developed anywhere other than the Western part of the United States. I think there's a tradition of of the desert as a place of kind of cosmic knowledge and of encounter with the beyond. And then, of course, you know, the desert in in California and Nevada and places is there's a lot of military land there. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of government secrecy there. And so that in itself kind of draws a certain sort of person who you know who wants to lift the lid on the secret and you know see, find the holy grail kind of under underneath it but you know i mean that said i mean yeah. i do think it's completely cool that the that the government has now you know admitted that project blue book and all that kind of thing was was a real project and that they you know they're they're showing us fairly recent video of unexplained flying objects being encountered by military aircraft i mean in, in a way um you know we seem to we seem to kind of be uh a lot, a lot of the UFO mythology, let's say, like around the way that the government appeared to be covering something up, which we, you'd think would be the most kind of paranoid aspect of it, the stuff that was least likely to be true, maybe has some kind of basis in in fact. And I mean, I one of them. I mean, I'd maybe to go on about this too much because it is a, an interest of mine. But the but the. I was saying we can go on, we can go on about UFOs as long as you want. Yeah, great. Um, there's a guy called Mark Pilkington who wrote one of the better books, I think, recent books about UFOs. Who, which and I wish I could remember the title of his book. He's a British guy and he's very very into the the culture of the of of UFOs. And he did a lot of interviews with people and and he he came to the conclusion that there was a sort of opportunistic element within this, this sort of intelligence services of the US military when, I mean, they they were developed, it's the Cold War, they're developing a bunch of new aerospace technology. Um, and then, you know, out of the blue, this kind of rumor starts going around. There are all these researchers suddenly saying, have you got aliens in there? And they decided that what better way of obscuring uh, a real research program of terrestrial military technology than to be able to kind of throw all this woo into the into the mix and and at certain points it seems that they that people have just basically just stoked the fire a little like kind of every so often one of these ufo guys reports some dude in an air force uniform turning up to say i'm going to tell you but i can't tell you and i'll deny it if any you know if anybody asks but it, you know you're onto something here and of course you know that just sets everybody a fire and they've kept that they've kept that going and that seems to me a plausible element in the confusion surrounding that story. You know, as a as a as a counterintelligence person, you would definitely take the opportunity to obscure what was going on if your mission was to keep your tech hidden. You, yeah, I mean, you talk in the podcast about uh, a, a punk rocker in in Germany who was apprehended by the the Stasi, and he. Uh, you you talk about how in part of the breakdown of privacy they they would tell people, hey so and so is an informant for the Stasi as a way of you know, so to to your point you know it's like yeah that's a good diversion right if you're like if you are trying to cover something up you interject that element of fan you know fantasy yeah I mean I mean right right now I mean in the politics that we're experiencing right now I mean we're beginning to understand I think even the most obtuse 
kind of you know credulous mainstream media person is beginning to understand that it's useful to certain people to have chaos that um that one way of doing censorship right now in a world where you can't really suppress information in the way that you could once upon a time is just as as steve bannon once said to flood the zone with shit you just put you put different stories that you put variants of stories you kind of you you keep on kind of just with sheer volume of stuff you make it very very hard for anybody to kind of have the energy to work through to what the truth is and so we're in this inf- very polluted information environment where you know, even when very serious scandals break they're instantly kind of surrounded by some stunt or some sort of other some kind of garbage that has been generated somehow and they very often get lost in the in the static and um you know that's that's in a way that's a challenge that we have to negotiate as kind of people are trying to act in the world now is to is to how we how we deal with this bombardment of of signals of various kinds and how um you know and how we navigate that world one way that i think that your podcast really uh, explains in part how to have the kind of conversations that you're talking about, how to have the ability to navigate the world, is that there's a there's a historical element to what you do and a deep sense of research, right? So when we talk about binaries, uh, I think a binary that is particularly attractive to the West and maybe even a little bit specifically Americans is the binary between the past and, and the present or the past and the future or the present and the future, and all of those, you know, they get kind of tangled up and, um, you know, your book, white, white tears kind of talks about, you know, what happens when you want to just take the art from the, from the context that it lived in and have it be its own thing without any baggage, the baggage catches up with you no matter what, you know? So, you know, I think one of my favorite episodes of the podcast was when you talk about Adorno and and Norman Vincent Peale, the father of, you know, what positive thinking sort of just like and and Donald Trump's favorite preacher who who, you know, performed one of his marriages, you know. So That's right. Yeah. So when we think about the past and the present, you know, um they're not individual things, right? That's not a binary. They're they're deeply connected. I mean, it's always been something I, I've found useful to do to try and understand the world as a as a sort of as a process in time, I suppose you could say. I mean, you know, you, you say the word history to people and they, they tend to think it's about it's about kind of names and dates. But what I get from kind of thinking of things historically is to try and work out what what made the present like the processes which made the present and very often if you kind of think of yourself as reverse engineering that um you get to some really really interesting stuff and and clearly america is a a future orientated society i would say it's very comfortable with imagining a bright future it's a little less comfortable with really understanding the past and um very different from some European countries. You know, I mean, I grew up in Britain, which is sort of obsessed with its past, but a slightly fake version of its past or an edited version of its past. It's very hard to imagine uh, imagine the future in, in Britain in the same way as it, it you know, is maybe on the, on the West Coast with a kind of uh, a, a sense that, uh, uh, you know, the, the world is young and the Pacific is ahead of you kind of thing. Um, but... You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, with 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 White Tears, a novel about these two blues, uh, these two young record producers who fake a nineteen twenties blues record. I kind of realized that there's a sort of racial conversation here in in the U.S. that um, is so uncomfortable and so sort of the is the, the everyday life is so sort of saturated with it that. And it is because of a kind of unresolved history, a sort of prematurely buried history. Like people, many people, especially white Americans, don't want to look back and say, yes, that happened. Yes, the emancipation was not the end of the the story of uh, of uh, black oppression in America. Um, 
and what's you know what is a premature burial other than the premise for a ghost story you know and um right and so you know all ghost stories are essentially about something that you know there was un, unfinished business in the past that is forcing its way up into the present and so you know it made me feel that maybe america you know one way of understanding america is to say that it's haunted it's haunted by this uh this prematurely buried uh racial uh strife and um and that you know that led me to try and frame a novel as a kind of a ghost story about that and because uh i'm very you know i care very much about uh, uh about um music and and uh, and i'd been listening a lot to sort of pre-second world war blues and folk music it kind of drew me i mean also it was a kind of great excuse to spend a couple of years really like immersing myself in in that stuff and meeting collectors and and you know having a a reason to to kind of dig far in yeah you you so did you hook up with christopher king uh but while you were researching that book that's right yeah i mean luckily i kind of i got to tag on to a, a little road trip that some friends were were making there's a music writer called Sasha Fred Jones and another one called Amanda Petrusic and um big fan and, of both and they they both I think Amanda already knew Chris because she'd been interviewing him for a book on 78 record collection collecting that she'd written and they said to me and actually another another writer called Casey Sepp so the four of us went down to to visit Chris and and sat drinking whiskey in his his record room while he growled at us and put on these extraordinary extraordinary uh records and then um you know he and I kept in touch and and he agreed to 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 read my manuscript and kind of make sure I wasn't making any factual errors and um you know we've stayed we've stayed friends and I mean he's had this extraordinary um kind of swerve that he's done in the last uh, few years in that he found some 78s of a Greek violinist a guy called Alexis Sumbas who was uh, who was the one of the last exemplars of this very ancient Greek tradition of laments these very sad slow kind of violin pieces and um and Chris got obsessed with him and is now pretty much moved full time to Greece and he's spending a lot of his a lot of his time in the borderlands between Greece and Albania doing kind of field recordings in these villages and the Greek government have hired him to 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 kind of make a a record and try and and try and kind of put together a sort of historical understanding of this sort of folk music so you know if if this damn pandemic ever ends and and i get to make another season of the podcast there's a there's a plan to you know to head for the hills in in northern greece with chris and and drink you know too much fire water with uh with villagers and record them record them yeah. like playing ancient music which you know i mean i i, I want to do that so badly <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I want to I want to go with you guys. It's such a he's they've put some of those uh, uh, Third Man Records has issued a compilation that he did of of some of some of that stuff, and it's fantastic. It's so incredible and uh, moving, and well, he's, you know, he's also because he's got this kind of encyclopedic knowledge of of uh, different forms of violin now. Because I mean, he's you know he knows his way around you know, Cajun violin and all sorts of you know and all sorts of. American fiddle traditions, but also he's, you know, he just sent me a record that I think, think third man did as well of this Indian, uh, violin tradition. I say a seven old 78 of mostly South Indian Carnatic classical violin. And you can really hear the connection between that and, and the Greek stuff. And, and, and also you can, you know, you can hear it, you can hear it connecting to fiddle tunes that you hear from, from Appalachia and, and things like that. So there's a, there's a, I don't know. There is a there's a kind of uh, uh, extraordinary excitement for me in, in knowing that that you know people like Chris are out there making these these kind of connections. You know, I'm very, you know, I'm very always very excited to sit down with a really serious collector of of almost anything actually, but music in 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 particular. Like, there's nothing there's nothing better than than being able to sort of say to somebody like play me you know tell me stories play me play me music and you know tell me the, why that connects to that and uh, yeah some of the best evenings of my life have been those kind of things 
Okay, let's take a minute to hear from our sponsors. Creators, are you tired of being paid in clicks and likes? Social media and streaming platforms help people find your work, but getting you paid is another story. Patreon is built for creators, not advertisers. Using Patreon, you can develop a sustainable income source by offering a monthly membership to your fans. You'll get paid, and in turn, they'll get access to your exclusive community premium content and a chance to become active participants in the work that they love. We went back and forth a lot when we were thinking about starting a Patreon for Aquarium Drunkard. We really didn't want people to feel like we were bugging them for money. But at the same time, running an independent outfit is really hard and it requires resources. And you have to have some way to get, you know, get paid for doing this. So Patreon for us has, has really worked out. It's been a great way for us to not only uh, build up the income that we need to keep things like the Transmissions podcast going, but also pay our contributors and to uh, get cool stuff to the people who care most about us. It's created this space where people can interact directly with us at Aquarium Drunkard, and that's a, that's a cool thing. And we're really excited to have Patreon on board supporting the Transmissions podcast. So... If you're struggling with a creative system that doesn't seem like it's working at all for you, sign up for Patreon. Head over to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, and start building the steady income stream you deserve. All right, let's get back to this episode of Transmissions. What was the first kind of music you got really into? You talk about being young and being into like, jungle and breakbeat and that kind of stuff is that where you kind of is that when you first got really excited about music or was that no i was i was i got into music very very young actually i think and 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 um i mean i sort of try and reconstruct the the rationale for the first few records i bought and it's quite weird there's a sort of um there was uh sort of British funk and soul music and also um, some sort of American electro music that I was listening to when I was kind of 11. And it's very, I mean, it, it's slightly to do that with where I grew up in that there was a tradition of these pirate radio stations that were on ships off the coast of Essex. And they, you know, this is sort of before my, my time really, but there was a kind of um, long tradition of love of American soul music. So even though this was a very white place, people were very serious about their black American music. So I got exposed to some of that. And the other thing that was going on when I was quite young um, was a sort of new wave, new romantic music. And I just, I got really excited by the sound of synthesizers. And so I had a, I had a, a, a love for things like the human league and, and uh, um, you know, um, new order and things like that and Japan and, and these, these, you know, mostly British, uh, new wave synth bands and that kind of connected to there was a lot of there was a lot of synthetic sounds in in like Africa Bambata and Grandmaster Flash and things like that that we were we were listening to as well and you know from there I mean all through my my teens I went in all sorts of different directions some sort of hipper than others I'd have to say uh you know with the uh, with popular music of one kind or another I had a sort of gothy cure phase i tried you know i was very um i went yeah i did go to see a lot of a lot of punk and indie bands in my teens but i was always at the same time interested in in um funk music and and, and various kind of dance floor music and so by the time you know i was i was sort of you know perfect age kind of late late teens early 20s when when the rave thing really hit Britain I was I was there from several different directions um you know and and these days so much of my music listening takes place in this you know the same room I'm in now I mean it's you know I'm 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 rarely on a dance floor I have to say probably not surprising but um you know I've 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 got very interested in all sorts of ambient and environmental music things that kind of music that creates spaces for thinking in and uh you know I I'm I'm uh, sort of trawling blogs and kind of reading other people's stuff to find out about strange highways and byways that I'd missed and all that. Yeah, 
You teamed up uh, with with Cold Cut for a, a BBC radio drama at one point. Is that oh, correct? Oh wow, you know about that? That's a that's. Well, a, I tried a to f- I tried to blast. find it. I tried to find it to listen to it, but I, I I couldn't I couldn't turn it up. Yeah, I've I've no idea if it's around. I mean, I can probably dig it out and send it to you. It was kind of um, like I knew Cold Cut from more from a kind of sort of tech world thing. Like they had a the Ninja Tune label that Cold that Matt and Jonathan, who are the two halves of Cold Cut, ran. Um, they had an office in um, near London Bridge in this kind of old wharf building, and also some other some other um, little tech kind of companies, more more like little web design operations, and a few artists were in the same building. And they had a space downstairs where they just hold parties and events. And I used to be a regular there, and there was all sorts of different 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 sort of things kind of crossed over there. A lot of like underground cultural things of one sort or another. Um, and then, yeah, the BBC wanted me to write an experimental play to be a kind of collaboration with someone. And somehow I think they actually, um, the BBC may have put us together for that project, but yeah, I wrote us, I wrote a very kind of, um, fragmentary script, which was all about, um, these things called the sound mirrors. I don't know if you've ever heard of, uh, yeah, of those. So there's a, I mean, basically just before the second world war, the, the British, knew a war was coming and they knew the great danger was going to be um, bombing raids. But it was before the invention of radar. And so they were experimenting with technologies about how do you do, how can you kind of get early warning about a a fleet of bombers coming over the English Channel? And they thought, well, if if we amplify sound in some way, so they built these giant concrete dishes, like these kind of parabolas. They were experimenting with different shapes of it. And it's basically like a kind of, imagine like a massive concrete satellite dish with a little bloke with a pair of headphones like at the back. And it's a kind of purely physical thing where they were trying to collect the sound or, you know, just make it at a level where, you know, somebody could hear it and, and identify it as incoming planes and they'd have some sort of warning. And they got a certain a certain way with this tech and then somebody invented radar and it and they dropped it so these things just became like monuments to uh, an an unused military technology so on this marshy ground and in, uh, in uh, i think it's kent actually yeah it's kent and um i mean i would sometimes go there with friends you know it's just strictly you're not supposed to go onto this ministry of defense land but you could pretty much break through a fence and kind of get to wander around these these things and uh and they were very kind of um i don't know they felt very pregnant with meaning to me about kind of i mean and i'd heard a story that i've never actually been able to find again which was about about somebody accidentally picking up transmissions from a world war ii bomber crew that had bounced off i don't know bounced off the moon or something like that and had kind of somehow come back years later so they were like the sort of you know a, a ghost a ghost radio transmission and i kind of you know all these ideas went together into that play and then and then matt and jonathan kind of chopped it all up even even further and did lots of sort of turntable wizardry to it so i'm not sure the whole thing was terribly comprehensible to anyone else but it was quite fun to to make in a in a sort of collagey way it sounds really interesting do you do you do you have the desire to do more sort of musical things at some I, point? Maybe? I would, I'd love to do something like that. I mean, and I, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to take, you know, to try to do some sort of sonic experiments in the podcast. I'm going to see, you know, I'll see if I can, uh, I can persuade the powers that be to let me, let me head off in that direction. But yeah, I mean, again, yeah. it's a lot, a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is wishful thinking right now because it's very hard to, hard to travel. But, um, but yeah, I mean, music, you know, even when you can't travel, music can take you to other sort of spaces and other uh, and, and other other places. And so, you know, that's a that is another another way that I feel I'm kind of well equipped to weather the pandemic because I have a lot of uh, a lot of alternate kind of head spaces to be in. Yeah, I feel that way surrounded by records and books in my, you know, it's like uh, there was this one point early on in the pandemic when the lockdown was was really it just sort of started and I was sitting in my office, like looking at all these books I hadn't read, but had purchased and records that I hadn't, you know, listened to in forever. And I was like, you know, 
a, a couple of weeks ago, I would have thought, I wonder if this is a waste a little bit, you know, just, but mm-hmm. luckily, you know, I've got this stuff when, when I need it, I guess, you know, which is a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, I find uh, somehow if everything eventually turns becomes useful, like all you know, every yeah. every every piece of weird kind of junk I've 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 held on to for twenty years eventually finds its way into some piece of work or other. It's just a question of you know gritting your teeth and and carrying those boxes up and down the stairs when you move when you move apart. Yeah, yeah. This will this will come in handy in the future and in the, in the yeah you know, who knows when. You're. Your new book, Red Pill, is is uh, the premise sort of starts off uh, similar to your own life, right? Where uh, it's about a writer who who ends up in Berlin for a residency, and he's trying to write a book, and essentially uh, just gets swept up in the insanity of the world right now. Um, I'm I'm curious. Do you do you find it difficult to to work? Uh, Let's say since uh, 2016 or so, you know, as things have sort of intensified and gotten weirder and weirder, does it become harder for you to work or are you able to sort of like get into a headspace where it's actually you know, not I th- I conducive? Think it's, but, I mean, you know. it, it, I think the, the, it's sort of both really like the, that feeling has saturated my work. I mean, that, that novel Red Pill has been the way that I've tried to kind of make those feelings of freak out feel useful and you know i mean i set myself the task of of trying to kind of put down the feeling that everything is is sort of sliding under your feet and that you're not quite quite sure what um how far things will go um and it is quite a paranoid story and it is a story about a writer who is in some ways quite like me and in in some ways allows me to kind of slightly mock myself and mock other writers for for certain sorts of hand-wringing pretension that we we have um i mean a lot of it i mean i do know friends who just they just can't their head is just not in the game i mean they really really can't do anything and people have kind of just defaulted to other sort of activities gone you know, organizing or, or, or whatever but um i found that actually the most centering thing for me is 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 writing and and is work and and um and so, I mean, actually, and also just in practical terms, you know, I, I have uh, um, the, you know, we have some childcare and we have some kind of uh, uh, ability to keep our routine together. I mean, no, we're not, you know, we haven't lost jobs that we need in order to survive or anything like that. So we're in a better kind of just sort of basic position than a lot of people. So I've, you know, I've, I've had, I suppose, a quite productive pandemic really. I've, you know, I've made the podcast, written a bunch of essays, I've kind of, you know, finished that novel and, and, and brought it out. And, um, I don't know, in a way I figure if I, if I work very hard now, when finally we can all go out and play again, then, you know, I'll be, a, I'll be in a good, a good place to, to, you know, to do that. Yeah. 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 Uh, in the book, the, the, the writer, he, he kind of finds himself drawn to this, this violent cop show, uh, blue, blue lives. I've been thinking a lot about this as our world becomes more and more difficult to suss out, difficult to sort, um, I've been thinking about that attraction to uh, comp- less complicated narratives and how, you know, uh, at a certain point, things things make s- such little sense all around us that I think people are starting to to want they want a narrative that doesn't feel so confusing or so ambiguous, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a natural human reaction to complexity, isn't it? I mean, in a way, you could say that's what conspiracy theorists want as well. I mean, their conspiracy theories are just a rather sort of artificial reduction of complex causes to, like, you know, five guys in a room pulling all the levers. Um, but yeah. but for But for the rest of us... I completely agree. There's something very soothing to me about about plot. Um, um, 
I mean, you know, my my kind of leisure activity right now is me and my wife, Katie, we're, we're watching again a second time this uh, French spy series called The Bureau, which is, which is you know, a... Uh, which is a you know a, a tightly plotted uh, thriller about French espionage agents, and uh, and that's yeah, it's completely compelling. It takes us out of uh, out of our, our own world. I was very interested to you know, I mean, all my all my writer friends watch too much shit TV. I mean, we all we all kind of consume a great deal of slightly trash narrative, and, and we're not even you know we don't even care. Like you can talk to the most highbrow. Um, highbrow you know high cultural novelist and they will eventually confess that they're you know they're deep into true detective or whatever it is um but my visual artist friends very often don't and they don't take the same sort of pleasure in plot they find it they find it annoying they find it a kind of artificial they they somehow kind of you know, their their relaxation would be in the visual field rather than the narrative. You know, I mean, I, th- I think it's always quite interesting to, to watch movies with people and then ask them what they, you know, what they were concentrating on in a scene. Like, you know, who's, who's there's some people are just looking at the amazing production design and other people are following why Dave said that to Bob. Um, but, you know, for me, certainly, yeah, kind of you know linear linear plot is is kind of comforting yeah yeah i think that you know what we're seeing right now like you know with something like q and on or something like that is what you're talking about though it is it's it's this but it's this weird thing where as uh fantastical and and you know batshit as like something like q and on is um it doesn't start, it comes from a human place. It comes from a real desire, you know? And I think it comes from a real recognition that like human lives might not be particularly uh, valuable to the people who run things, you know? So you do get the sense of trying to come up with the story of 2020 or the story of right now it's 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 really difficult and it's really difficult for people and i think it's kind of driving us a little bit batty all of us you know because there's just no how do we process this stuff and how do we how do we deal with it as somebody who who writes novels i mean do you have any advice for us well i mean i think i mean i got i i wish i had the 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 soothing answer but i mean certainly i mean novels i think are quite good at processing this complexity like in a novel you can you can you can attack a subject from all sorts of different directions and and i think novels are are very good at, at sort of synthesizing all sorts of different kinds of perspective on a situation um i guess what's happening to us is that we are this is the first election cycle that we've had you know certainly the first kind let's say in the last five years there's been a kind of information ecology that's never really existed in the world before um and i think you know what's happened is that the same things that have gone on forever are just you know about about people telling lies dirty tricks kind of covering things up bit partisan kind of misinformation all that's gone on forever, but with the ability that speeded up, you know, the ability, the, the 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 distance between like a fly landing on Mike Pence's head, and there being thirty Mike Pence fly accounts on Twitter, and the Biden campaign having a picture of Biden with a fly swatter, like I mean, that's minutes, and that's a wild yeah. pace, and we have been at that pace for years now, and. And the kind of proliferation of connections and the speed with which any piece of information, true or not, can kind of filter through the system is only matched by the fact that because we're also in this these kind of conversations with these algorithms that are recommending certain material to us and kind of suggesting that we connect with certain people who have similar profiles and not with others, you know, we, we are in these bubbles and therefore the kind of consensus reality to use a, a slightly kind of Phil Dick phrase you know is uh is fragmented you know i mean i think that's maybe one of the things that he understood long before other people was that you know one person can have a particular 
you know, version of the world then, you know, going on for them and they can be in the same sort of geographical space as the next person at the coffee shop. But, you know, they can be in conversation with the, you know, with a, a cosmic voice. And um, that's, I think, what the experience that we're having with each other is that you kind of, you run into people and you're not sure necessarily which reality they're living in, you know. I mean, you know, right. and, and there are these little tells like kind of, do you wear a mask? Um, you know, do you do you believe? You know, do you do you want to save the children? Do you? I mean, all these kind of different different things that there's almost like nothing that isn't a a subtle uh, signal for one group or another, and that's that's very hard for us to 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 navigate. And I mean, you know, I mean, most of the solutions for it, or most of the kind of I don't know, not solutions, but like. Uh, the kind of good habits that you can develop do have to do with disconnecting when you need to disconnect, make sure you have kind of multiple sources of information so that you don't kind of accidentally buy some sort of version that's been, you know, easily refuted elsewhere, you know, and these, these yeah. are sort of hygiene precautions almost, but I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of needing to just kind of make, you know, just step back when you need to step back kind of, go go outside for a walk kind of thing yeah i think yeah that's 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 crucial you can't stand in front of the 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 hose all day you know what i mean because there's just there's there's no there's no way to process or synthesize or even know sometimes what to do with all this information you know yeah i mean i've been reading there's a philosopher called timothy morton who wrote a book uh called hyper objects and he he ha he has a sort of great idea that I mean we're we're in the time which is which is now kind of defined by these objects that are so extended in time and space that we as humans can only kind of grasp little tiny bits of them. We get kind of traces of them. I mean his you know his big example is the climate. Um, you know we we don't experience the climate. We experience weather, or you know we experience some kind of particular event, but that's not a picture of what has changed in the climate. And so we're right. We're kind of, you know, and, and you know, you think of any kind of planetary scale event or anything that's got a very long duration or anything that's very wide in scope, like a war or an uh, oil spill or you know whatever it could be. We have to we have to accept that we don't have a full picture and we don't have full control, but nevertheless we have to work out how to act and how to how to kind of. Um, how to kind of find our way through this this slightly spooky world one of my favorite episodes of the podcast also is the one where you talk about the early internet and you talk about sort of the idea of of futurism and imagining futures and sort of imagining what might happen and what it might look like and how we're going to get there and, and all of that stuff and so um right now i i think it's really difficult to imagine what the future might look like because who knows, you know, everything changes every couple of days and it feels like nothing's off the table, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. But kind of one of my pet theories, of course, is that if we lose the ability to sort of think constructively and hopefully about the future, we, we might, you know, lose the ability to create one as well, because, uh, you know, everything, the future, like the past creates the present, you know, that's what we're doing right now. So, I wonder if 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 uh, as a sort of uh, a one time you know futurist or, uh, or or you know something like that if if you think you know what 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 might the future what what are some helpful ways to think about the future right now at a time when it feels so so dire? Well, I think I think your um, your summary there is really good because I think the most productive way we can think about the future is is something that we're active in building. And, and through imagining possible futures and f imagining possible worlds, um, those, you know, we, we draw ourselves towards those possibilities. You know, we set ourselves, you know, versions of things that we would like to move towards. And that's a kind of prelude to action. And it's a prelude to us being able to, to kind of take practical steps to move into that future. I mean, that's why, you know, I think science fiction is such a sort of useful 
form for for thought in that there's that kind of very pure speculation about well maybe it could be like this or wouldn't it be terrible if it was like that i mean obviously it's a way of us talking about amplified versions of the present day but it also does have a very very kind of concrete effect i mean we, we i think we know quite well now that um there's a feedback loop between the uh, tastes of, of engineers for, for certain sorts of science fiction and speculative fiction and what they decide to go and build. I mean, you look at, you look at um, early uh, cyberpunk books and, and even kind of before, before that, um, you know, books imagining virtual spaces and, and people basically went out and tried to build the thing that sounded so cool in Neuromancer. Yeah. And, and so you know it's it's an it's an important cultural form i mean it's very interesting the kind of uh the slew of dystopias that we got around the kind of middle of the of the decade and 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 a, and a feeling of 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 kind of almost burnout with the idea of dystopia which had seemed quite kind of exciting as a, you know now now it just seems like a sort of duplication of the same it's like we're spinning our wheels it's like yeah we know if we do nothing it's gonna you know we're gonna all be foraging for canned food in the ruins of our our cities but you know there's kind of narratives that are feeling exciting now often are kind of to do with the eruption of something fantastical into our into our kind of quotidian reality and i mean i don't know whether that's a way of us figuring uh you know trying to kind of make art that's about this moment where a lot of things seem to just kind of come out of left field into the into the cultural mainstream and we're like we we play catch up you know i mean who could have predicted q who could have predicted the pandemic who could have predicted the reality tv presidency who could have you know all this uh it would have would have felt fanciful and is very kind of destabilizing and so you know of course this is a world where we're gonna have we're gonna go and watch i don't know like a kind of tentacles erupting out of the out of the ground that's kind of what it feels like being alive right now yeah yeah and 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 i guess so if if we through you know a, a mix of passive imagining and active imagining if we're creating the future then there is a, a a little responsibility i think and i think that's what we're all sort of waking up i think if 2020 has taught us anything if this pandemic if if everything that's going on is it's that uh whatever you know track we're on <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna need to maybe yeah, get off uh, the train's probably going to derail so what what's next you know yeah i mean i think uh the the confident prescriptions of the of the mainstream now appear very foolish and actually the ground is sort of cleared i mean there's the rubble of a lot of people's world pictures is is kind of around us right now and some of the wiggier and more speculative and kind of wilder versions of, of of reality seem actually to have been closer to the to the mark. I mean, we're in you know, so we're in, we're in a moment where where we can think about you know how we would want to do things differently. Um, I mean, I certainly um, I think the sort of senior political figures right now still don't fully understand what happened to younger people after 2008 and the way that the system has not delivered any kind of meaningful prosperity to a lot of smart educated active people like people who are you know people who are kind of under whose lives are not what they felt that they deserved and who are deeply disaffected and who are heading some to the left, some to the right, but who are very much looking for for uh, another version of of things. And so, you know, with you know, you look at the pressures that the pandemic has brought on, the kind of uh, and the kind of increasing obviousness of the climate crisis. Then that's a recipe for for a sort of bumpy ride ahead. But you know, it's it's. Uh, I know I was I was like these, these the ancient Greeks had two uh, conceptions of time. There's kind of Chronos, regular time, the kind of sequence of one thing after another. But every so often, into Chronos erupts Kairos, this time of chance, this time when everything is up for grabs and and the future can be seized. And and that's what I think where it where this is what this moment is now. There was this sort of suspension of this the sort of the normal. 
and it's never coming back in the way that it was even if a kind of bunch of stuff is going to get recuperated but right now there's a time of chance and 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 it's a question of who seizes it and what they do with it i think that's a great a great place to end and hari i deeply appreciate you taking the time man this is a really fun talk cool man it's really is a real enjoyable conversation Hari Kunzeru, here on Transmissions. Red Pill is available wherever you get books. I recommend supporting your local independent bookseller. And Into the Zone is available wherever you stream podcasts. As is Transmissions, of course, so if you enjoyed this chat, feel free to share it with a friend. You can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, too. That helps new people find the show. And if you want to take your support a step further, head over to our Patreon page and toss us a few bucks. I'm Jason P. Woodbury. I write, host, and produce transmissions. Our audio is edited by Andrew Horton. Jonathan Mark Walls edits video for YouTube. And Justin Gage, aquarium drunkard founder and wise man, is our executive producer. Tune into his weekly two-hour show on Sirius XM, channel 35, every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. California time. As for us, we'll be back next week with another strange talk for these strange times. Until then, stay safe and take it easy.